On this Thursday night, the push to pull back the curtain. America's top prosecutor moves to unseal the search warrants on Donald Trump's Florida home. I personally approve the decision to seek a search warrant. Brutal beating. The man attacked in his own driveway and how his mother is being hailed a hero. From state of the art to shredded apart, inside the world's largest cargo plane destroyed by Russia's war. Plus, he was their super fan and good luck charm. You guys win the game. The emotional goodbye to a bright light for the Edmonton Oilers. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Just three days after the unprecedented search of former President Donald Trump's Florida mansion, the United States top prosecutor has delivered a brief yet impactful address to the nation. In his first public statement since the FBI descended on Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate, Attorney General Merrick Garland says he's filed a request to make the sealed files related to the search public. The department filed the motion to make public the warrant and receipt in light of the former president's public confirmation of the search, the surrounding circumstances, and the substantial public interest in this matter. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. Under my watch, that is precisely what the Justice Department is doing. Now, exactly when the documents will be unsealed remains unknown. But even without their full release, this move marks a willingness by Garland to refute what he calls unfounded attacks from the American right. Jackson Prosco is following this developing story for us tonight. Jackson. Well, Farah, Trump and his allies have been assailing the Justice Department for days now, baselessly claiming the FBI planted evidence after suggesting the search warrant served at Trump's Mar-a-Lago home on Monday was unnecessary. Now, in filing to unseal the search warrant, the Department of Justice is seeking to let the public know exactly what they were searching for. The warrant will detail the location searched and the items searched for. What's key here, though, is that the DOJ's motion to unseal says the court should do so absent any objection from the former president. Remember, Trump has had these documents since Monday and has so far chosen not to release them. A judge has just ordered the Justice Department to talk to Trump's lawyers by tomorrow to find out whether Trump will object to the release of the search warrant. Farah? Jackson, Attorney General Garland uh, also said he personally authorized the search warrant. So what else do we know about earlier efforts to retrieve these classified government documents from Trump? Well, there are reports that Trump received a subpoena in the spring for the sensitive documents believed to be in his possession. These are documents he allegedly failed to turn over earlier this year when he was asked and agreed to return some 15 boxes taken from the White House. Now, reports suggest the documents were so sensitive to national security that the Department of Justice felt it had no choice but to execute a search warrant to recover them, which the Attorney General hinted at today. The Department does not take such a decision lightly. Where possible, it is standard practice to seek less intrusive means as an alternative to a search and to narrowly scope any search that is undertaken. In a statement tonight, Trump claimed his attorneys were cooperating with the DOJ all along and that authorities simply got, quote, way ahead of themselves. But Farah, he did not say whether he will oppose unsealing the warrant. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you, Jackson. Police in Ohio say they shot and killed a suspect who allegedly tried to break into the FBI office in Cincinnati. Investigators say the armed man approached the visitor screening area but took off when confronted by agents. The suspect, who was wearing body armor, abandoned his car on a country road, leading to an hour-long standoff with police. There are reports that the suspect may have had ties to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. U.S. officials say the Canadian at the center of this week's Amber Alert entered the states illegally by driving through a barbed wire fence. Officials say Benjamin Martin Moore, a convicted sex offender, crossed the Saskatchewan-Montana border with a woman and her two children. U.S. Border Patrol agents found a cut fence and alerted RCMP. Moore was taken into custody in South Dakota on Wednesday. The children were found safe. Their mother is also said to be in custody in the U.S. There is a war of words going on over the state of health care in Canada's biggest province. Staffing shortages have led to some surgeries being cancelled and even some hospitals closing their doors. Frontline workers say the system is in crisis. But as Mike Drolet reports, Ontario's health minister doesn't see it that way. 
Ontario's health minister had to see this coming. Question after question about staff shortages in hospitals. My question to the Minister of Health. Reflect on what it would be like to be unable to breathe. How many hours will Londoners have to wait? And whether the government was looking to privatization as a solution. No, no, no. Talking to reporters, an embattled Sylvia Jones acknowledged staffing is an issue, but bristled at the use of the word crisis. Let's be clear. There is not a crumbling system in the province of Ontario. The issue came to a head this past weekend, with two Ottawa hospitals having to temporarily close their ERs. A similar situation is playing out in Clinton, Ontario, which was forced to shut the doors to its ER today. An accident can happen at any time, and if it's not available, it could be, it could be life or death. When it reopens Friday, it will have limited hours. We're running at about half the nurses that we need uh, to uh, open this uh, department on a 24-hour basis. So it's really concerning. The pressures are significant. Uh, the burnout is an issue and a concern for us. The wellness of our team, major, major issue. So we make these decisions, obviously not lightly, but they're right. For weeks now, Catherine Hoy of the Ontario Nurses Association has been traveling around the province to see the situation firsthand. She has no qualms about calling it a crisis. My phone blows up day and night, surgeries being cancelled. And we heard that that isn't happening, but it is. The nurses' union says the system needs 30,000 new hires in Ontario and financial incentives to keep the 23% of its members who are eligible for retirement from walking away. Frontline workers insist the crisis is real, and if it gets any worse, the health minister may have no choice but to agree. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Before we introduce our next story, a warning that some people might find it disturbing. Police in Brampton, Ontario, are looking for a group of men who attacked a Punjabi media personality in his own driveway. Security video shows three assailants dragging the man out of his car. Jyoti Singh Man was badly beaten just days after receiving a death threat. As Sean O'Shea reports, this isn't the first attack within the community this year. The video is difficult to watch. The man in the Jeep on his driveway in Brampton, Ontario, approached by three masked men armed with an axe and machete. They drag him out and beat him repeatedly. The brutal attack captured on a home security camera. When I saw the video, it was so shocking for me. Neighbors watched it later online. We've blurred the graphic images, but the man's mother saw it all unfold. So they came, she's saying they were here to kill him, uh, and uh, he grabbed one of the weapons, but uh, they overpowered him, obviously, with uh, uh, three of them, and then uh, one of them grabbed the legs and continued to hack away at his foot. She ran to her son to help and may have saved his life. Yeah, and, and boy, was his mother... Uh... Um, a hero, what courage she showed. Uh, she ran out. It was uh, a, a pure uh, reaction on her part, and it certainly helped contribute to him still being here today. Jody Singh Man is well known here, a local real estate agent and prominent Punjabi media personality. Police confirmed he'd received a death threat on the phone days earlier. A safety plan was put in place with the victim at the time uh, that the death threat was reported to us. But Mann didn't receive police protection in time. The mayor says Mann's family has asked for help again after the attack. When the attack happened, I got a call from the family who uh, wanted protection from the police. Police are still investigating motive, but this is the third physical attack in the last year on people who work in the media in Brampton. Question how safe our media personalities are uh, in giving the news and you know giving commentary as well. For now, police are left trying to assure the community it was a targeted attack. Police say additional video may solve this case, and so they've appealed to neighbors to check their dash cams. For now, Jody Singh Mann remains in hospital with serious and life-changing injuries. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Brampton, Ontario. New satellite images show major damage at an airbase in Russian-controlled Crimea after a string of deadly explosions on Tuesday. Before and after images reveal deep craters from what appeared to be a precise attack. Nine military jets were destroyed, according to the Ukrainian government. Russia is denying any damage. Ukraine has not claimed responsibility. But the attack suggests Kyiv may have obtained new long-range strike capability. Ukraine's Ministry of Defense is also warning Russians not to visit Crimea. The largest plane in the world was destroyed when Russia invaded Ukraine in February. The loss of the Antonov Maria was not only a cultural and technological blow to Ukraine, but the entire aviation community. 
Efforts are underway to salvage parts from the engineering marvel, but it's painstaking work. Our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gaman Singh was granted a rare inside look at the monumental task ahead. She last took to the sky one year ago, performing a fly pass celebrating Ukraine's Independence Day. Now she lies in ruins on this airfield. Vladimir Smooth scours the wreckage for recognizable pieces of the Maria, the plane that made Antonov a world-famous aviation company. The gigantic plane lies in sections, and staff are scattered around salvaging parts. Along with the Antonov spokesperson, Global News was granted a rare view from inside. Yeah. He says, I just came here for the first time. The site is overwhelming. The Maria was the world's largest cargo plane holding more than 100 world records, including the heaviest payload ever lifted. Employees do not really like to be photographed in front of the background of the destroyed Maria. The rebuilding effort is underway. It's a priority for the company and the nation. But what happened at this site is under investigation by Ukrainian authorities. Russian forces targeted the Antonov airport on day one of the invasion. The helicopters flew at extremely low altitudes, rose from behind the forest belt and opened fire on the objects of the Antonov airport. As he watched paratroopers drop onto the airfield, he gave the order to return fire. When I see all destroyed Russian equipment, it makes me happy. The Ukrainians, he says, were dominated from the air. Without artillery support, they were soon outnumbered and forced to pull back. The Maria was just one of the casualties of the fierce and bloody battle that raged here for weeks. Ukraine eventually reclaimed the area. We were not prepared for war. They figured some missile strikes were possible, but not an invasion of the airfield. Widely shared video shows Russian forces seizing the airport and all of the buildings. But for this longtime employee, the video isn't necessary. He was there that day. Is that this building? Yeah. So those staircase, that mm -hmm. staircase, is that staircase? Yeah. Yes. It's believed the goal was to create a Russian base within striking distance of Kiev. The main administration building here at the airport is pretty much destroyed. This was the air traffic control tower. As you can see, there's really not much left of any of it. Russian forces stormed this administration building. They used the control tower area as a lookout point. From here, they could not only see the airfield, but also Hostomel, Irpin, and over that way, Bucha. As Russian forces arrived, civilians nearby suffered tremendously as Russians were unable to push forward to the capital. Homes were looted in the region, people were beaten, killed, or taken hostage. Rudenko says some of his men who defended the airport remain in captivity. He wouldn't say how many. What he did say about the Russian captors is unsparing. All of you will be in fire. The emotions fueled the desire to rebuild the Maria bigger and better, a new symbol of Ukraine and its endurance. Crystal Gamansin, Global News, Hostomel, Ukraine. An ominous warning about security. Coming up, what the RCMP wants MPs to know. Plus, Canadian tennis fans serve up some love to Serena Williams. Canada's National Police Force has issued a stark warning to members of Parliament. Global News has learned that the RCMP have briefed federal politicians to advise them foreign actors are likely monitoring their digital devices. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has been digging into this and she joins us now with the latest. Uh, Mercedes, what do we know about the threat to politicians? So, Farah, we got curious about this after we heard the RCMP speaking at a committee earlier this week talking about uh, the ability the RCMP has to turn on the camera or the microphone on Canadian cell phones in criminal investigations. And we started to wonder, well, if the RCMP could do that, could someone else do that? What about our politicians? And we heard from a senior RCMP official there who said they have told politicians this could be a threat. So we asked the RCMP what they're doing to protect parliamentarians. And here's what they told us. They said that on an ad hoc basis, 
basis. In the past, or when requested, the RCMP has provided parliamentarians with briefings regarding the vulnerabilities of wireless technologies and smart devices. They said that these investigations are multifaceted and could or would include investigation of foreign surveillance efforts of various types. They wouldn't specify what states they're worried about, but a lot of experts say Russia and China for two examples. And they also wouldn't tell us whether they've actually found spyware on any parliamentarians' phones, but it is certainly something they're saying is a significant concern for them. Okay, uh, coming back to Canada, Mercedes, do we know if any other agencies are using similar techniques on Canadians? Well, that's the next big question. If we know about the RCMP, but we didn't before, who else is using it? We talked to the public safety minister, Marco Mendicino, today and asked him why this technology is being used at all and if he's comfortable with it. Here's what he told us. Look, these investigative techniques, which are deployed by law enforcement, are um, necessary given the new sophisticated uh, lengths to which organized crime are using encryption techniques and other sophisticated technologies to avoid being detected. So that is the minister defending it. We asked CSIS Canada spy agency if they're using this in a statement. They told us they take privacy considerations very seriously and that robust safeguards are set in place to ensure Canadians' rights and freedoms. They also said that they use a variety of investigative techniques, but they wouldn't tell us specifically whether or not they use this one or whether or not there has been a privacy investigation into whether or not the use of any potential technologies like this breach Canadians' privacy rules. Okay, Mercedes Stevenson, thank you. Yep, that's a tornado on fire ahead. A look at more raging wildfires in California. While the state of emergency is staying in force, the wildfire situation in Newfoundland and Labrador appears to be stabilizing. Fire crews say the paradise-like fire hasn't grown over the past day. And while the Bay de Spear fire has shrunk, a change in wind is allowing for ground crews to safely tackle the flames. Up until now, most of the attacks on the fires came from planes and helicopters. The improved conditions are allowing for the major highway through the area to remain open, but drivers are being warned smoke from the fires could limit visibility. And across large parts of southern British Columbia, all eyes are on the skies as forecast storms could bring lightning strikes and spark new fires. Fire crews are getting the upper hand on the Karameas Creek fire and evacuation orders for 54 homes have now been rescinded, but nearly 500 families are still out of their homes. All the smoke has now prompted a special air quality statement for the Okanagan Valley. At the same time, one of the major highway routes through the B.C. interior was closed after a mudslide caused by a sudden rainstorm. The mud and debris blocked a section of the Trans-Canada between Lytton and Spence's Bridge, an area where there have been multiple wildfires over the past few summers. Crews are on scene working to clear the mud and reopen the route. A brush fire that erupted in California grew so fast, its heat and wind generated a smoke nado. The fire broke out south of Bakersfield and quickly engulfed more than 40 hectares. At its height, more than 200 firefighters were working to put it out. The cause of the brush fire is still under investigation, but crews say it's already 80% contained. Remembering the biggest little Oilers fan. Next, how six-year-old Ben Stelter inspired the hockey world. Like I said in my article, I'm terrible at goodbyes, but uh, goodbye. <laughs> Toronto! <laughs> That's tennis legend Serena Williams with heartfelt goodbyes to a standing ovation at the National Bank Open in Toronto last night after wrapping up her final match on Canadian soil. The sports icon recently announced she's retiring after she competes at the U.S. Open in a few weeks. Williams received a few retirement gifts on her way out of the six, though. She and her daughter were both given Maple Leafs and Raptors jerseys. The hockey world is mourning the loss of a beloved six-year-old superfan who inspired fans and players alike. Ben Stelter died after a brave battle with brain cancer. His loyalty lied with the Edmonton Oilers, but everyone was cheering for Ben. As Dan Grummet reports, the young boy made the most of his time on the ice. He wasn't the first kid to stand on the blue line alongside his favorite players, but Ben Stelter's time as an honorary Edmonton Oiler lasted long after the national anthem finished. 
The little boy, who was diagnosed with an aggressive form of brain cancer at age four, quickly captured the hearts of hockey fans and became a regular at home games. Chanting your name out there. <laughs> fans even chanted his name. Oh, look at that. I'm all cheering for you. The team embraced him too, inviting him to practice, into the dressing room, and once awarding him the game MVP helmet. And your it didn't hurt he was a good luck charm. The Oilers would go the rest of the regular season undefeated with Ben in the building. He's been a real inspiration for us and I mean you can tell, I mean we've been rallying around him. But Ben's infectious smile, laugh and attitude masked what he was going through. Ben Stelter is in the building tonight. Five-year-old Ben is a fighter. Fought he did until he no longer could. Ben's father posted the news on Twitter, writing, Our hearts are left with a Ben-sized hole in them, and life will never be the same without you. We are absolutely crushed. He was uh, an amazing, um, amazing little guy who lit up every single room he was in, certainly lit up our room. He's going to be greatly missed. What he went through really puts everything into perspective. And you guys win the game. Let's get kids up. So much of sports is about rivalries. Ben loved the Oilers, but everyone cheered for Ben, a little boy who made a big impact in the hockey world with limited ice time. Good try, Oilers. You'll get you next year. Dan Grummet, Global News, Edmonton. And that's Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Farah Nasser, and on behalf of our whole crew, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is the village of Campbellton, Newfoundland, and Labrador. We love seeing your Canada, so please keep emailing us your pictures to viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night. <laughs>